to have you um, uh, here for the second day of the harmonization on, of test methods for nano and advanced materials. Uh, today we have a very interesting morning uh, with uh, five speakers that uh, will cover different aspects on uh, regulation, OECD, and things related to graphene. So um, as yesterday, uh, please try, uh, the speakers, please try to keep uh, on your time. If I see that the, the time of the speaker is dangerously coming close to an end, I will let you know with a couple of minutes in advance. Uh, I will try to be gentle in reminding you. And if uh, you finish on time or before uh, with some time for questions, we will proceed for questions. If someone goes um, uh, beyond their time, I will I will be quite emphatic to to bring this to conclusion, please, because we have to respect the the time of the other speakers. Um, and then if if you take all the time, then we will not be able to have questions for that specific presentation. Uh, but I am sure that everybody will will keep uh, record on their times and. Um, so we will have a, a lunch break uh, in uh, about two hours. So uh, with no further ado, if uh, everyone is uh, present, we already nearly 60 in the room. Uh, now we have, uh, uh, as, I, as you can see in the, in the agenda, we will have uh, Elizabeth uh, presenting uh, OECD test guidelines for nanomaterials, support and future steps towards TG development by Malta Initiative um, and NanoHarmony. And after that, we will have uh, Eric Blecker with status of challenges and challenges in regulation and graphene. Uh, and then we will have a, a session on pre standardization activities for pristine graphene with Charles Clifford your Radnik and uh, Terence uh, Barton. So um, if uh, Elizabeth is, uh, is ready, uh, we have still uh, four minutes uh, before starting. Uh, so if Elizabeth is ready, you can check your, your presentation and maybe we can start. Or if anyone has a question before Elizabeth starts, uh, it's the right moment to, to ask. No questions. So, uh, Elizabeth, you can check your presentation, please. Yes, hello. So, I will try to share my presentation. Um, let's... So, hello, everyone. My name is Elisabeth Heunisch. I'm working at the Federal Institute for Occupational Safety and Health in Germany. And I have the pleasure today to present on how NanoHarmony and the Malta Initiative is supporting test guideline developments for nanomaterials and also how they support future test guideline developments. So to put it all a little bit into a context, what are we talking about? Where do we come from? The overall goal is to have OECD test guidelines fit for the future, and in this case, with a special focus on nano and also advanced materials. And this all started with the Malta Initiative in the year 2017. Within this framework, we had various projects supporting test guideline development for nanomaterials. There are a few here on the slides, naming NanoRigo, Gaffa Nano, RISCON, NanoHarmony, and NanoMed, but also now the new projects that started now and that also support this workshop where we are now, meaning macrame, eye care, and nanopath. So um, the overall goal is to have OECD test guidelines fit for the future and to support that. There was also the suggestion to have a European test method strategy. I will mention later on more on what that means and what the goal is here. And this is all supporting a safe and sustainable Europe. So looking now into NanoHarm and now first looking into what is the Malta Initiative. The Malta Initiative started in June 2017 with a goal to fit the gaps of missing test guidelines for nanomaterials in reach. That is where we started on. 
and it is to ensure that nanomaterial safety regulation keeps pace with innovation, but also to strengthening European and international cooperation to setting priorities and test guideline developments, to involve all stakeholders, and also to initiate activities to support the test guideline development. The MOTA initiative is a network of international experts that advocates for appropriate test methods and the first steps for nanomaterials, as already mentioned. We all work on a voluntary basis without any official mandate. And the MOTA initiative addresses the importance of international harmonized and standardized testing and measurement methods. So one activity supporting the MOTA initiative was the NanoHarmony project. The NanoHarmony project was working in three work packages. The first one was to develop and validate test methods for OECD test guidelines and guidance documents for nanomaterials. The second one was with the goal to form a network to interact with all relevant stakeholders. And in the third work package, we developed the structure to translate science into test methods used in regulation and to be more effective in bringing scientific results, test method development into test guidelines or other th standards that will also support regulation and industry in fulfilling the regulatory requirements. With this goal, we built an anaharmony legacy with five items. That is on the one hand, we're having regular online workshop, the training material, white paper, the test guidelines and guidance documents for nanomaterials and the process mentor. And all the, these items are supporting OECD test guideline developments now, but also future OECD test guideline developments that go beyond the field of nanomaterials. So the test guidelines and guidance documents for nanomaterials were supported from work package one and work package two. Within this, NanoHarmony supported eight different OECD projects on nanomaterial testing. The first one was on the solubility and the dissolution rate, then the surface chemistry, the dustiness, the concentration of nanoparticles in biological samples, the tiered approach for reliable accumulation assessment, the test guideline on toxicokinetics, the integrated in vitro approach for intestinal fate um, of orally ingested nanomaterials, and also to provide further guidance on the OECD test guideline 201, 202, and 203. You can get an overview of ongoing um, developments for test guidelines and guidance documents for nanomaterials in a status report that was um, developed together with NanoHarmony and NanoMed. And apart from ongoing development, it also lists finished documents that were adapted or newly developed to cover nanomaterial testing. The status report is from the last year with also the status from last year, actually. So what is the status of those projects that were supported by NanoHarmony project? Um, they, most of them aim for finishing the OECD documents by the year 2025. So they are in the last step of the validation studies. The results of the validation studies need to be implemented in the OECD documents, and they then need to go to OECD into the different discussions um, and finish the discussions and going into commenting in the, into the um, official commenting rounds with already set the goal to finish those documents in the year 2025 for most of them. I think the one on the bioaccumulation is close to be finished. So probably this year or next year will be published. Having a further look, NanoHarmony project also formed the network to interact with the different relevant stakeholders. And for this, we had eight webinars on covering different topics for um, nanomaterial um, test guideline development. For example, here the identification and, sol and solving barriers for translating science to regulation and standards, but also different webinars on the different phases for test guideline development that were identified, identified by the NanoHarmony project. On top of those webinars, we had regular online workshops each year in November and also two in-place events. One was a joint workshop with NanoMed at the OECD and then also a NanoHarmony policy meeting in Brussels in May this year. 
And actually, those online workshops were very successful with many participants, and that's why we decided, or the new project, Macrame, I Care, and Nanopass decided to follow up on this one. So we again now have in this year in November a workshop. That's why we all here. And thank you very much for your participating, and thank you very much for everyone who is putting an effort in this workshop and presenting and discussing with us today and also already yesterday. Um, looking at further nanoharmony legacy items, we're having also the white paper, the training material and the process mentor, and they're very much aimed at supporting future OECD test guideline developments, also beyond the field of nanomaterials. So they are not focused on specifically on nanomaterials. So the objectives of the process mentor and the training material are to raise the awareness for the importance and also the benefits of harmonized test methods. They're informing on the steps of OECD test guideline development process and also on the OECD and its relevant committees. They show possibilities and benefits for active participation of various stakeholders. They give insight into the scientific, scientific and also political barriers of the, pro of the process. And they provide an understanding of the complexity and the timescales of test guideline development at OECD. It is also to help trainees, users understand how they can contribute to the OECD test guideline process or either by using test guidelines in their work. So it's also important that they are used, that we use harmonized testing, but also to contribute to test guidelines or to bring their work further and bringing them into a harmonized test method and to get test guidelines adapted or newly test guidelines um, developed on basis of their science. So looking into the NanoHarmony training material, the training material is built up into four modules. It is the first one in, on the importance of standardized and harmonized test methods. Then there's one model on the OECD and its relevant committees one on different documents in the OECD test guideline program, and one, the longest one actually, on the process of development of OECD documents. The slides from those modules can be combined and used for training or also by, for example, um, giving lectures at university and can be used according to the purpose they are needed for. Um, the NanoHarmony OECD test guideline and guidance documents process mentor is a web-based tool. You can see the web address here on top. It's testguideline-development.org. And it is a tool that has multiple entrance paths. So you can go in by role or institution, by phases or processes, and it also contains useful resources. That is actually how it looks like. So you can see here, for example, the different institutions listed. You can click on them and get more information, how they can get involved into the process of test guideline development, or down here you have the different phases identified in NanoHarmony and get more detail what is happening and needs to be covered in the different phases. And also some more details below here. You can click on all those things. You can get timelines, tips and tricks, and all the other information. Mm. A further output from NanoHarmony was the white paper from science to test guidelines. The issues in this white paper addressed are to ensure up-to-date OECD test guideline. It highlights the importance of communication and exchange of information for that process, that we need to engage, engage the scientific community besides others, of course, it is on the validation of new test methods and also on funding for activities towards test guideline development. And you can also find the link down here. The recommendations in the NanoHarmony white paper are aimed at a greater support towards a more efficient OECD test guideline development process and also on improving managing the greater pace of innovation in new chemicals and materials with appropriate test guidelines. 
There is a need for interaction between all the different stakeholders in a structured way. We need easy accessible information and also education on the test guideline development process. And we need more structured funding to allow up-to-date test guidelines that are fit for purpose. So NanoHarmony finished this year in September and there's no direct follow-up project that will take up um, the different goals pursued in NanoHarmony, but we also see the de development and adoption of OECD test guidelines for nanomaterial is not finished. As Wim de Kuhn said also in one of the meetings, NanoHarmony um, did. So he said, we only covered one fourth of the part so far. And we also see new challenges upcoming due to new advanced materials and also due to new methods that shall be integrated into test guidelines, as we also saw in the discussion yesterday, how can we get in vitro method and also NUMS into harmonized and standardized testing. So all in all, what we can see is that we need to keep and even increase the effort in the test guideline development for nano and advanced materials. So that is one of the reasons why the Malta initiative proposed a European test method strategy. It is promoted by the, Nano, uh, by the Malta Initiative Precision Paper on support safe and sustainable innovation to help overcome trade barriers and to make legislation enforceable. And the Nano, uh, I'm sorry, I'm still stuck at Nano Harmony. And the Malta Initiative Precision Paper is supported by various institutions and also member states via the ministries and others as well. So you can see here the status um, from this year in, in November who supports the Malta Initiative position paper. The European test method strategy includes on the one hand a request for funding of researchers for the development, but also mainly for the validation and harmonization of test methods and in includes that we need an international platform for collaboration and exchange, and exchange between stakeholders. And we need that exchange to identify the endpoints and also the gaps related to test, testing of nanomaterials and advanced materials. It is to support international collaboration between regulators, researchers, and industry in test guideline development it is to ensure the development of test methods that are also operable and useful in regulatory, but also in pre-regulatory testing and for scientific testing, and to help increase the likelihood also of the effective adoption and implementation by the OECD member countries in getting test guidelines accepted. The conclusions of the Malta Initiative Constitution Paper are that the adoption and the development of test methods requires an intensive um, effort. It is often underestimated in terms of time, human, and also financial resources needed. Individual researchers in industry across and industrial actors or even the EU member states cannot undertake the challenge of test guideline development alone. That's why we say, see that a coordinated approach can be more effective and avoids duplication of work. And that's why we're asking for a European test method strategy to get the challenges done together. And we also need a strong European financial support that we get the validation and the harmonization of test methods that we need for safety testing of nanomaterials and advanced materials, and also of course, for other chemicals. A further, Activity started within the Malta um, within the Malta initiative is the preparing a priority list. This priority list is on de defining the priorities for making OECD test guidelines and guidance documents applicable for nano and advanced materials. We started this list to highlight the importance of the activities but also to provide guidance for decision and decision makers towards funding to guide and encourage scientists to support work towards OECD so that they know that their work can be used in test guideline development and is needed, but also to collect sources to support these activities 
and in general support the work at OECD. So we just finished a draft for that list and we're co collecting currently input via a survey. So you can see here the link to the survey and you're all encouraged to comment and to give input on this first draft of a priority list. So last but not least, I would like to thank the Nano Harmony team for building all those outputs I just have been able to present here. And I would also encourage you to check out the Nano Harmony legacy. So when we provide these presentations, oh, sorry, um, there are links behind here, the different mm, items. So you can find the Nano Harmony um, mm. legacy and also the survey on the priority list in here. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. <clears throat> so we have a few minutes for uh, some questions. Uh, if someone would like to raise uh, your hand or just open your mic and uh, talk. Uh, if not, I, I, I have uh, th this kind of uh, efforts are, are extremely important considering the growth uh, pace of uh, of um, uh, nanomaterials and advanced materials and new kind of things that we can use and wear. So, so one of your in, in one in your to, towards the end of your presentation, you you talk about uh, that we need to to have strong financial support at uh, from at the European level to to keep uh, pushing this harmonization. Uh, how big is the challenge for for European projects once they finish? Because uh, you may have a very very good strategy during the four years of your project, but of course many things will happen towards the end of the project, especially a very strong um, uh, results from the scientific side of the of the project will will be. Uh, evident uh, towards the end of the project. So how, how big is the challenge uh, for the projects once they end? And how strong is the commitment of of the European uh, Commission to, to keep uh, helping in this regard? We know when the project is comes to an end, the, the funding stops, and then you may lose relevant people helping you to push this forward. And uh, is there a clear plan to keep this moving forward? <laughs> so so I, I guess there are a lot of questions in, <laughs> in, in this, this one question. So um, on how can we move on after the project finish? I think it depends also where you started in your project and where you finished with your project. So um, I guess if you start with just just the test method development, so starting with the scientific development of the method itself, and you have not started doing a validation, there's a lot of work left. So you also need quite some time to do the validation after you develop your test method. And you need some time and resources to, for example, go through OECD to start the process of getting acceptance of harmonizing of discussion of the different discussions with the experts and the OECD member countries. So that is also one request that we say we need projects specifically on the validation and harmonization of test methods. So picking up test methods that were already scientifically developed and doing this step of validation. And then Still, that's what we done in NanoHarmony. So we started with test methods that were already out there in most of the cases and did the validation and started in parallel the process at OECD. We need to also say that this is member country taking the lead at OECD and being responsible. So that can be only supported by a project, but not the work can be done by a project at OECD. So we can support it scientifically. We can support it by building up possibilities for exchange with different stakeholders and experts that will then also support at OECD. But it's a member country that needs to take there the initiative and being responsible. And those are also the one that will finish now the projects NanoHarmony supported. So as I said, they 
want to finish their projects most of the times by 2025. So they still need to finish and they need to continue working on this. They need to finish the OECD documents. They need to go through the commenting rounds and then hopefully um, have the test guidelines and guidance documents at the end in 2025. Okay, um, so, so we need lots of lobbying uh, in this regard to keep this moving forward. Uh, it, it's a big concern, I think, for, for yeah, most Yeah, and, and then on how much the commission wants to support this, wants to fund this, I'm not sure. So we need to see, okay. <laughs> to be honest. So there is some commitment. Um, yes. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Any other question in the room, please? No? Okay, uh, we are right on time. We have 76 participants now. And uh, please, Eric Bricker will talk about stats and challenges in regulation of graphene. So, Eric, uh, if you could share your screen, please, or your presentation. I will. Um, if you give me one moment. And good morning to all, at least the morning in Europe. Um, morning. And thanks for um, making it, uh, giving me the opportunity to share some thoughts. I hope you now see my screen. Yes, please go ahead. Great. Um, yeah, I was asked to talk about the status and challenges in regulation of graphene. Um, and I'm willing to do so, but the caveat is that I won't go into all the regulations in detail. Uh, I will provide some more general um, issues, I would say. Uh, first, uh, uh, and I, I will focus mainly on the reach, but um, I think those issues that will come across there will also uh, be relevant for other regulations, I would say. Uh, but very briefly, um, well, the, the reach regulation is there since 2006. And around the same time, concerns started to emerge on the safe use of nanomaterials. And for the OECD, uh, there was a reason to start a working party on manufactured nanomaterials at that time. And after um, several years of this group looking into the details and the issues that might arise with and, and what are the nanomaterials exactly, um, the OECD Council came with a recommendation to apply existing chemical regulatory frameworks for nanomaterials and, and adapt those regulations when necessary. And that is generally what happened uh, around the world. Um, what we learned from the nanomaterials case uh, was that there was uncertainty about specific legal obligations uh, are, are certain data requirements applicable for nanomaterials are there were uncertainties on the methods or tools used uh, for a hazard and risk assessment so are these appropriate for nanomaterials and and especially the increased importance of physical properties that uh, was an issue there. And what also came about that these these type of uncertainties, they generally uh, delay innovations because industry don't know if they want to invest in these type of materials, if it's, if it's so uncertain whether they can actually bring it to the market. So that was some high level lessons we learned from the nanomaterials and in some of those uncertainties uh, were tackled in uh, an adaptation of the reach regulation and that was uh, published in 2018 and a very important one was that uh, 
the characterization of nanoforms in reach. So um, they use the term there as a nanoform of a substance. Um, so still focusing on the substances that, that reach had already on, on the chemical substances. Uh, but for those nanoforms uh, require additional characterization, um, a specific name, uh, but more importantly, some physical uh, parameters like particle size distributions, how, how the surface chemistry looks like, what the shape is and the surface area. And then based on that for each of the nanoforms, uh, some uh, uh, additional requirements like in a separate assessment of the nanoform, uh, additional uh, physical chemical properties or uh, parameters uh, to be addressed. And there were also some adjustments in waivers. And if you want to know all the details, there's the link there. Um, And then graphene in REACH, if we look at the nanoform definition that is in REACH currently, it states uh, things about the size distribution. It's based on the commission recommendation of a definition in from 2011. So, um, and their graphene flakes are specifically mentioned um, in the definition. Uh, which implies that for graphene, um, in general, the nanospecific requirements apply. Um, how that changes with the, well, maybe in the future, um, currently reach uh, discussions on reach revision are ongoing, but that will still take quite some time uh, and, and final decisions will not take place before uh, a new commission is installed. So it will take a few years uh, before we actually get further, uh, really uh, adapted reach uh, regulation. But looking at what now in the new nanomaterial definition from 2022 is um, recommended is on, on these type of materials is the is this part uh, particle has a plate like shape one external dimension is smaller than one nanometer and the other dimensions are larger than 100 nanometers that still fits with uh, uh, graphene being part of so even if they reach will pick up this definition then still graphene flakes are uh, or graphene in general is uh, covered under reach and nanospecific requirements will apply. Just as a background. Um, probably not new to most of you, but still uh, always good to get people on the same page. Um, graphene, it's it's a complicated uh, thing. It's not necessarily just one uh, specific form uh, but it can be a whole range of different forms. And, and graphene and, and graphene-based materials, those are terms that are commonly used, but also commonly used uh, uh, um, uh, kind of uh, in, in the same way. So uh, it's not always clear what we talk about when we talk about graphene. Uh, what is clear is that there's a huge range of different forms and it is a 2D material, but uh, graphene can have different numbers of layers. They have, uh, they can be uh, oxidized. They have different dimensions and all of this can have an influence, of course, on how they behave and how they should be uh, assessed. Uh, furthermore, there's a lot of potential applications that may benefit from graphene or those type of uh, graphene uh, based materials. This is just some examples I found in a, a paper by Young et al. And all of this, but, uh, the, uh, for all of these materials, it's 
the behavior and effects in humans and the environment are difficult to predict based on what we know from uh, current nanoforms. So that's that's a clear challenge on how do we deal with it. Uh, there's a huge range of different materials which make it difficult for, for the regulation. And uh, the fact that we cannot easily predict how they behave is, an, is another one. Um, and then, of course, the identification is becoming difficult for these the whole range of different materials. Uh, the Graphene Council has published a framework, which is, I think, in the next presentation. So I won't go into the details there, but it's just to quickly show how difficult uh, things could be. Um, this framework uh, identified 19 parameters to describe the graphene form produced. Um, but if we look back uh, at the reach, we don't have that many uh, parameters. And you may wonder whether that's sufficient to fully characterize uh, graphene for a risk assessment in reach. Again, uh, a, it's a question and, and a complication in, in regulation for these type of compounds. Going in more into detail, uh, graphene has been registered um, in the reach, uh, under reach. So uh, if you search the database from ECHA on, on the term graphene, you get these different uh, out this different output. Uh, graphene itself is is registered. Uh, graphite has some uh, the the graphite uh, reach registration has graphene nanoplatelets mentioned there. Um, there's a reaction product that has uh, that has a public name as graphene oxide. And as those are the ones that are registered under reach, and then there's some notifications as well on on other forms. Um, if we look more into the detail of the registrations themselves, so those the the graphene uh, the reaction product, so the the graphene oxide and graphite, there's differences. Um, Graphite is, is a major uh, tonnage produced per year. That's that's uh, on the left, the uh, over 100,000 produced. Um, and also individual uh, companies produce quite a lot of graphite, uh, always above uh, 1,000 tons. Um, for the graphene and, and the graphene oxide, in this case, you see that the tonnage levels are much lower, uh, especially for the individual companies. Uh, they are really in the lowest tonnage levels of reach. Uh, and that uh, has an influence on what is required for those uh, as um, information uh, for those type of materials. Um, in in general, there's uh, the Annex 7 is a lot of uh, uh, physical chemical properties and some generally uh, acute toxicity testing is, is required there. Um, for the compositions, um, the graphite is, is uh, registered as a bulk and solid powder um, and inorganic. Uh, the, the other two are, are registered as, as uh, nanoforms or sets of nanoforms. Uh, and for those, the shape information is there for, for graphite since it's so, uh, so broad. Uh, a group of uh, substances. Uh, there's no real data, no direct data on on this shape. There. If you then have a more 
critical look or detailed look at the nanoforms that are registered in graphene or graphene oxide, it's clear that there's generally broad boundaries of for the nanoforms. So in in the the size boundaries are are relatively broad, and also other the other requirements like shape and, and surface area are generally in in uh, identified in in broad ranges of of the uh, for each of these parameters. So still not fully clear what what is registered there, and uh, there appears to be some limited information on the acute toxicity, um, but the long-term toxicity data are not available, but also not really required. But uh, apparently also, um, if you look at the literature, because one of the requirements is to provide all the available information in, on, on your uh, substance, the long-term toxicity data are not there. And well, there's clearly, um, uh, th those are more costly, so usually not done in, in uh, scientific settings either. Um, but there is information on graphene-related materials on toxicity, and uh, ECAF summarized what is available uh, just recently. Uh, this was published in June 2022. A report uh, on the potential impact of graphene and other 2D materials. Uh, this report identified that the toxicity is influenced by accumulation of the material, the density of the material, size and shape, oxidation state, and all of this uh, also in how it interacts with uh, cells. If we look beyond graphene, just to see what what else uh, uh, may come up, we see already that, well, for other materials, that's the bottom lines there on the table on the right. Um, there is much more uh, limited, inf the, the, inf the number, <clears throat> sorry, the available information is much more limited. Uh, where we have at least for graphene and graphene oxides, uh, uh, extensive information was found on both toxicity and ecotoxicity. And for the others, uh, in, in some cases, no information is found on ecotoxicity. So. And that makes it, of course, more difficult for those type of materials, although those are not that uh, abundant on the market either. Those are more in the research phases, the, 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 the uh, 2D materials beyond graphene. Um, again, in vitro, in vivo studies uh, for graphene materials uh, have revealed some uh, general uh, patterns, kind of. Um, and this is the important things that uh, was found. Uh, some are obvious, like size and particulate state and oxygen content. Um, but also Im important finding, I think, is also that it really depends on what cell, what type of cells you look at, uh, whether uh, something like a gra graphene oxide is more toxic uh, or not. The report also comes with a a uh, range of recommendations uh, highlighting the important issues. Um, one that I would like to highlight here is that it's, it's the third one that it's difficult to generalize um, conclusions on toxicity and ecotoxicity, which is, of course, difficult, makes uh, life of um, regulators and risk assessors there uh, more difficult. Because basically you also need to have much more tests, uh, which then also comes back, of course, to the uh, industry who has to provide the data here. But if we want to summarize this 
a bit more. This is the literal text they have in the report. If I summarize that, uh, it's important that the materials are identified uh, and characterized in detail. And also the dosimetry and exposures in the test systems should be uh, clearly characterized um, in the risk assessment. And that then raises the question whether the current method um, methods that we have available here are sufficiently detailed to require that, um, or maybe the methods need adaptation there. Another point is that to we have very little knowledge on, on chronic toxicity, immunotoxicity, genotoxicity. So the, yeah, I mean, yeah. Um, I'll speed up a bit. Um, so those are also items that we don't really know how to, whether test methods are suitable or not. And there is the role of impurities. Um, the, so mainly the residues from the production process. There's regulatory challenges test, just to kind of summarize, you have the diversity and, and complexity of these materials. Um, and the current regulations may not align with that complexity. Do we have a, a mixture of toxicities, for instance, at a very small scale? And it's, of course, always a challenge to keep pace with innovation, uh, new materials that enter the market, uh, um, how, how to identify what is upcoming. Uh, so we need a kind of a foresight system to be regulatory prepared, uh, including the need for uh, identifying needs for new or adapted uh, methods, what are the data gaps, uh, and, and then based on that, what would be the most important next steps to make sure that regulations keep at least some uh, uh, keep uh, to some extent keep up with the innovations. Um, what more concrete next steps uh, currently um, or just recently, uh, the Netherlands uh, put a, put forward that they intend to start a substance evaluation um, under reach in two thousand and twenty five to have a more look of uh, what kind of issues do we come across if we look at reach and these type of materials. And, and then uh, in that pro process, ECHA will do a compliance check, looking at uh, how is the substance identified and is that clear enough? And then um, as also um, Elizabeth already hinted at to some extent is, is also, um, we need to identify the test method needs uh, and also raising awareness in the regulatory arena that they are also prepared for new materials that come to the market, uh, among which is graphene, but also the other advanced materials, I would say. And that's my last slide. So thanks uh, for your attention. And if there's any questions, if there's time for that, uh, I'm okay. happy to answer. Thank you, Eric. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we are uh, already two minutes behind the schedule, so maybe we can uh, save the questions for uh, for the end of the session if there is time for more questions. Yeah. I, I'm sure there are many. Uh, this is a very important topic, especially for the the pace of growing in the in the field of graphene. Thank you very much. Uh, now we have. Um, uh, session on pre standardization activities for uh, pristine graphene. So Charles Clifford. Uh, we'll talk about ESO and BAMAS activities on pristine graphene. So, Charles, please, if you can share your your screen. Thank you. Right. Hopefully everyone can see that. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Charles Clifford from the National Physical Laboratory in the UK, and I'm going to talk to you today about uh, pre-standardization 
pre-normative activities in VAMAS and the standardization activities in ISO are uh, looking at graphene and other related 2D materials. These, both these activities are very much an international effort involving uh, multiple uh, experts from around the globe. So we've already talked a lot about um, regulations and, and, and reach in, in graphene from Eric's nice talk. Um, it, it should be noted that we have hundreds of companies selling uh, graphene, but really, as Eric pointed out, graphene comes in a wide variety of different forms. And really the question is, what is my material? What is the material in the product? What is the material I'm testing? There are lots of commercial products out there these days, uh, from sensors to, to concrete, to sort of advanced foams, um, all sorts of um, and golf clubs and sports uh, equipment, etc. Um, and all of these things mean that we need to have a clear control on, on what the, the 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 graphene related two D material we have in our product, um, and for that we need validated methods and standards. And what are we looking at? Well, this this session is entitled Pristine Graphene, but really pristine graphene in, in this perfect honeycomb structure really only exists in computer generation and modeling. CVD sheet grown graphene probably comes closest here with a with a nice structure, but we do have overlayers and, and defect regions. Most of the commercial, early commercial products um, are in, in powder form uh, or from liquid uh, dispersions, suspensions, and these can have a wide range of different forms from nice plates through to sort of different sizes, different shapes, overlaps, all sorts of things. Um, and, and that's just the morphology. So over the last few years, um, ISO uh, in ISO TC229, which is in nanotechnologies, has been developing a, a framework and of documentary standards giving uh, best practice and consensus agreed uh, methods um, to be able to characterize um, graphene and graphene oxide uh, using looking at structural features. These are for the powders and also for the chemistry as well for looking at, at the flake form, the graphene nanoplatelets. There's also a standard being developed on the sheet form, the CVD grown graphene. And then there are um, overview standards as well. I'll talk in a minute about um, terminology. Uh, Terence Barkin is going to talk to a bit later about uh, graphene framework. And there's also material specification in there. And a good few years ago now, um, there was an overview uh, technical report published looking at characteristics versus measurement methods. Um, so some of these documents have been published. Um, a lot are led by uh, myself and Andy Pollard at the UK, but very much getting international uh, support and, and buy-in into these. And there are also a lot of them 
dual logo with IEC as well. So terminology in this area is, is really important. It's so important that we all know what we talk about when we use terms. So we have the, the ISO 80004 part 13 series on terminology for graphene and related 2D materials. Um, this first version was published in 2017. If you Google it and click on, go to the ISO website and click on preview, you can have a full uh, view of it. It's also available on the ISO OBP online browsing platform as well. And there, um, there's a very nice definition of two-dimensional materials. So uh, there's a very nice definition of graphene, defining it as single layer. Then we have few layer, three to 10 layers, graphene oxide, etc. cetera. Uh, and now the second edition is being uh, developed at the moment. And really, the most important advance for that second edition is introducing uh, this term graphing related 2D materials, um, which is uh, the sort of overarching term, including all the graphene types up to 10 layers, graphene oxide, reduced graphene oxide, functionalized graphene, graphene nanoplatelets. So a GR2M is a carbon-based 2D material consisting of one to 10 layers, including those. We've heard over the last two days, various terms that perhaps you shouldn't use to describe this. Those are graphenes, graphene-based material, graphene-related material. All of these were considered for the overarching term, but were rejected by international experts. And I, I can go over those reasons if you want, but not now given time. So I would encourage very much of the use of the term GR2M when talking about um, commercial products um, in this area. And we've at MPL, we've very much had a, a journey for developing our measurement standards, now moving on to measurement standards, where in the lab, we've developed the method and refined the method, and then we've tested that method internationally using uh, international interlaboratory testing, uh, where we test and validate methods. And we use VAMAS for that. Um, Georges Favre gave a very nice introduction to uh, VAMAS yesterday. And we're using technical working area 41, particularly in graphene, uh, but also others in Raman and, and surface chemical analysis. And then once the method is tested and validated, this then moves on to the standards, the documentary standards committees, particularly ISO TC229. Also, a lot of the ISO standards then get adopted by SEN or developed in parallel with SEN uh, if, in order to become European EN standards. Um, and of course, we also work with, with other standards bodies as well. In terms of um, international interlaboratory testing in this area, we can see that there have been uh, 15 projects, uh, some of which have finished, some of which are ongoing, and these have involved 18 uh, countries internationally. Um, I'm going to talk about some of these, and a lot of these have been 
I used to underpin uh, various uh, international standards. I should say that a lot of the work uh, in this area over the last three years has been funded via the ISO G-Scope project, which was a European metrology uh, project. Um, and with partners, uh, it was led by myself uh, with partners, including uh, LNE and uh, BAM and INRIM from metrology institutes and also uh, standards bodies and uh, commercial graphene companies as well. So moving on to the standard, uh, this one, 21356-1, looks at structural characterization of graphene from powders and dispersions, and it gives an order of methods for characterizing graphene flakes, giving various characteristics here, lateral size, thickness, um, number of layers, and using techniques such as BET to give specific surface area and SEM, AFM and Raman spectroscopy. The first version was published in 2021, but with only informative measurement methods. Given we, over the last few years, the ISO G-Scope project has been working on validating these measurement methods, particularly focused on the AFM, SEM, and Raman. And so uh, for our interlaboratory testing using SEM and AFM, participants uh, were sent uh, two industrial graphene samples um, mounted on substrates. Um, one of the substrates here was for AFM, included a built-in calibration grid, um, and uh, the other one was for SEM, and again, they were sent a calibration grid. Participants measured 200 flakes using SEM and 20 plus representative flakes using AFM to give thickness and lateral size. Um, the results here uh, so far are that you can see that there's quite a scatter of results. And as I said, these are really commercial samples. So there's a wide range of, of flake sizes in there, ranging from about 20 nanometers up to 3000 nanometers in size. What was very clear was that participants had difficulties identifying what flakes to measure. Some participants measured aggregates or agglomerates, multiple flakes, thinking they were one flake. And some participants measured chemical residue on the surface, thinking it was a flake when it was just chemical residue. So this really showed that guidance in better flake selection instruction is needed. Um, and once MPL also analyzed participant SEM data, we saw that the mean variance was greatly reduced. For CVD, uh, we've also got a relevant standard here being developed um, using, again, Raman spectroscopy and this time TEM. The VAMAS on the Raman has been complete. Intensity calibration has been shown to be important there and also data fitting. The TEM study is um, underway in this area. In terms of chemical characterization, this is really important. Um, and here 
we have XPS, X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy as the key technique to give you quantitative elemental composition, binding state, and important uh, elemental ratio, such as oxygen to carbon ratio, when looking at whether you've got graphene, uh, reduced graphene oxide or graphene oxide there. You can also use additional techniques and uh, Dusan Losik uh, in a few minutes is going to talk about some of the work involving TGA. Uh, to underpin this standard, we had um, five uh, interlaboratory studies. Um, this document is going to be submitted for, for final uh, a ballot soon. One of the the main VAMAS ILCs that we looked at was uh, on uh, XPS of functionalized graphene, and this was led by Jörg Ragnick from BAM, who's going to speak next, but not about this subject. Um, this involved 26 participants internationally, and participants were sent four functionalized samples, so functionalized with oxygen, nitrogen, fluorine, et cetera, and a, a, a normal graphene commercial sample. And they were also sent two calibration test samples. They tested three different sample preparation methods, those of pellets, those just of powder stuck on tapes and also sort of compressed into wells. And results um, so far show that 20% uh, uh, uncertainty, relative uncertainty is realistic for the vast majority of participants. Um, outliers here were shown to be due to uh, humidity, high humidity, uh, storage of the samples that can particularly alter oxygen functionalized um, samples, and also um, sample preparation, whether performed on uh, pellets or tape um, as powders. Um, can and does affect the measured result. So the oxygen to carbon ratio, for example. And this is due uh, simply to the information depth of the uh, instrument and also related to the morpholog morphology as well of our flakes. One minute, please. OK, that brings me nicely on to the summary that uh, commercial graphene samples, um, as Eric pointed out, are complex and not pristine. Um, we need standards in terminology, graphene related 2D materials, and in measurement standards as well to enable valid and repeatable results to know what we've got. And we need to underpin these documentary standards via VAMAS interlaboratory testing. So my thanks to, to all these uh, people and thank you um, very much for, for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Charles. Uh, there's no time for questions, uh, unfortunately, uh, but I, I am sure by the end of the session we could uh, come back if there are any questions or uh, uh, you can answer something on the chat if someone wants. Uh, let's move to the next uh, speaker, Jörg Radnik. Uh, we'll talk about the achievement of the graphene flash flagship and the way forward. Uh, so Jörg, the, floor's, the floor is yours, please. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. I will share my screen now. Okay, 
Uh, I'm Jörg Ratnik from BAM. Uh, I don't want to speak about XPS and ILCs. Now I want to speak about the Graphene flagship, the achievements and the way forward. And first I want to say something about the Graphene flagship. What's, what is the Graphene flagship? What was the Graphene flagship? The Graphene flagship was founded, uh, oh, this was the wrong way, no. Now we are here. Uh, the Graphene flagship was founded uh, 2013 as European project, and there were uh, a ramp up phase, and there were three core phases core one, core two, and core three. And it was finished more or less in September of this year. Uh, then this great project was uh, finished, and it was funded for uh, 10 years. This, it was clear that uh, the funding was for 10 years. The funding was about 400 million euros. And one of the reasons for the success of the Graphene flagship was not only the money, it was also the, the time. But after this 10 years, there was a new structure of the of this Graphene flagship was uh, uh, initiated. And if you see, this is now the so-called Graphene Flagship Initiative, uh, which more or less of, uh, of 130 partners, uh, different IRAs, and there is still uh, a pilot line uh, in this flagship or its plan as a, a certain uh, pilot line for uh, producing graphene in a, or graphene products in a value uh, in a higher amount. And there is one coordination and support action. And I want to say something about this, the time now, if we are speaking about the graphene flagship now, we must speak about here, these things, these are these 12 IRRs and IRs, also research innovative actions and innovative actions. And they are uh, active in the field of electronic and photonics in the field of biomedical approaches, especially biosensors, uh, in the field of energy, in the field of composites, and in the field of 2D materials of tomorrow, which are more or less basic researches, and which is important for today, I think, in the field of safe by design. This plays also an, a, an important role. And then there is one CSA, a coordinating and supporting action, which yeah, coordinate and support all these uh, IRAs and IRs of the Graphene flagship. And this coordinating, also it's something like an umbrella over all these other projects. And uh, this uh, uh, CSA, this uh, consists of six partners, China's University of Technology and China's Industry Technik here in, or in Gothenburg. Then uh, the ESF uh, in Strasbourg, uh, Fraunhofer ISE in Karlsruhe, uh, University of Cambridge in Cambridge and the BAM in Berlin. And the one of the aim or the aim of the CSA is really to coordinate and to support all these IRAs and IRs and not to make uh, some research or some innovation by uh, him itself. And it will coordinate the dissemination activities, for example, events. I'm thinking about the Graphene Week, which, which is a very important event or conference annually uh, in Europe. Then the industrialization and to this field of industrialization, there's one uh, task is standardization and regulation activities and the alignment, which means liaisons also with other European national inter and international activities. For this reason, I'm also here today. What is the Graphene Flagship Initiative? And I want to uh, say something about the partners. If you see here, a great par part, uh, uh, one third of the partners are small and middle uh, uh, enterprises. Then you have uh, a, a quad of universities and research target organization and technical uh, organization. And then there are some others. And what is uh, more or less uh, the, the message is that you have uh, uh, SMEs, research and technology 
technology organization and universities. And you have a good mixture between companies, applied and basic research. But uh, what is the fact is that all, all these three partners, or if you are thinking about universities and uh, also uh, on SMEs, these are not so uh, active in standardization and regulation activities. They have more or less less experience in this field. Charles, give us some overview about the standardization activities today. Uh, I want to summarize it shortly. We have same stand standardization projects under the re responsibility of ISO TC229. Uh, three are published, seven are under development. Uh, he said something, and I want to uh, really stress out that the standards always describe the con consensus of the international community and uh, more or less, this is not the top of the research. It's really the consens uh, It's really a consensus, and this takes time. And at the moment, the standards are focused on the basics, which is very important. I think about vocabulary, as also terminology, classification, and on the material, not so much on the applications of the materials. Uh, about the, uh, some word about the graphi uh, graphene flagship and the standardization until now. The graphene flagship has laid 80% of the European standardization projects in the field of graphene. At the moment, Europe is in a strong position against the trust of Asian countries. I'm thinking about Korea and China, uh, where standardization is state aided and funded. We, we always all must speak about money. This is also an important point. And the European projects were successful in standardization. But a new phase begins. We have the new structure of, uh, of the graphene flagship and also uh, ISO G scope as a metrology project finishes. And what are the expectations about this uh, new phase or at this now? The project partners say clearly they want to develop some competitive products. Also they want to, they are interested in products now, not so much in material, really in products. The society say, of course, we need some safe and sustainable products. And the European Commission says, uh, I say it also, they, from the EU, EU strategy on standardization, standards are the silent foundation of the a European Union single market and global competitiveness. And we have the kickoff meeting of the Graphene flagship the last two days. And what is very clear, what was a clear message that they are really interested in the global competitiveness. This is a very important point for the European Commission and also on a working single market, of course. What are the challenges at the moment or now? The first challenge is we have heard a lot of about this is the material. Charles says something about this. Eric says something about this. You have really a variety of morphology, sizes, composition. I don't want to go in detail to this, only to say you have usually not this nicely computer printed single layer graphene on a substrate. But now we are some facing some challenges. We have discussed it a little bit. And one which is always discussed in, uh, or which is always discussed, and it's from uh, it's really starts out by the companies is that we must go from more material focused standards to more product or application focused standards. Now, what is my material? Star, uh, Charles, begin with this. Usually, the producers know their materials, but not the users. And the users are interested in properties of the materials, not so much in the structure. Product, products are often much more complex than the pristine or the raw materials, especially if we are thinking about complex matrices, about the use of graphene in device, device for example. Then a second point is the market is dominated by SMEs. I think the new graphene flagship initiative shows it. One third are uh, funded are uh, uh, of the funded project partners are SMEs. Their actual standards for characterization, this is always discussed, are validated for highly sophisticated and for our time consuming method. And I must mention here XPS, I like this method, but it's it's really a, a, always a discussion with the 
especially with the uh, SAM, and they said we need easy and validated quality control methods. They are thinking about optical methods, easy titration method, and so on. Then we have shortly this discussion, Eric mentioned it, there's always a dis uh, discussion in the graphene community, are 2 d materials really nano? According to the EU definition, Eric says it clearly, and I see it also, yes, but there must be a, a, a discussion about this if the reach criteria are really suitable for 2D materials. And we must really identify gaps in the noble knowledge about the 2D materials, especially in health and environmental issues. The next point, and Eric also mentioned it, and it's, it's very important, graphene and beyond. If you see, uh, especially in, in some other points like electronics, photonics, and so on, it begins now with working with emxenes, molybdene sulfide, and so on, all these things. And um, this is also a very important point, and you must really think about which insight about the frame related materials can be used for these other 2D materials, as if we go this step beyond. And another very important challenge is, and this was really stressed by the European Commission, is that we should create a unified Euro European voice of graphene community to strengthen European competitiveness, which means we must work together. We must bring the community together. We must work together in these fields. I'm speaking about the next steps, uh, about some more concrete steps. Um, there, there are some or there is some need for further standardization activities, efforts for epitaxial graphene, because it plays, and you see it also in electronic, in photonics, biosensors, and so on, a very important role. And there is a clear need of going forward in this point, because this seems to be this, the, I want to say the, the fields of application, which are at the moment seems to be the most important. Another important point are contaminants of graphene-related ma uh, materials. And especially if we are thinking about manganese, uh, calcium permanganate in graphene oxide, this is a really critical point. And we have a really, as of now, there was some art we need. There are some standards from some of the companies working in the graphene flagship. And I think this is a, good field for collaboration between regulation and standardization. And I said it at the beginning or at, uh, at the challenges, there's also a need for quality control methods for easy methods, which can be easily used by especially uh, small SMEs and so on. And there was a discussion at the last ISO TC229 meeting in Berlin, begin of this month in November. As I think we are thinking about in the Graphene flagship to forward this to see in this point the next steps in the standardization. I want to thank you for listening. Um, as I said, this is my contact here email. And I'm also working in the sister project of uh, Macrame and uh, Nanopass and so on in Accords. So I see it from different point of views. I, see that no, not only from the side of the graphene flagship, then also on the, from the other side of developing methods. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Jörg. Uh, we have uh, time for a few questions, if anyone uh, would like to raise a hand. If not, I would like to to make a common question, and and you you talk um, at some point about uh, competitivity, and you talk about quality control, and uh, it bothers me, or it, it's a huge concerns to concern to me uh, when it comes to um, competitors, partners, colleagues, or whatever you want to call. It. Uh, coming from other regions that they may be not as uh, uh, strong in the requisites or the requisites they 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 ask to companies uh, in order to to follow the quality control and we are importing 
to Europe, um, lots of stuff from these places. So, so where where the competitivity comes, uh, and and I mean we have seen this in some very different uh, markets, but the one that comes to my head is the the toys that children use. Uh, and and they have, uh, for instance, uh, endocrine disruptors, uh, chemicals in the composition that are banned in 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 Europe, and somehow they are not reported in toys from from China or other places. And we import these without knowing, and then we have still exposure to things that are banned in Europe for the use, but we are still getting exposed. What's the what's the problem, or how's the deal? regarding graphene compounds, uh, gra graphene materials uh, related in this aspect? I, I think this is a very good point. And I think as a, there are some very well-known problems. As a, I'm always speaking about manganese and, 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 and because this is, now, this is now a critical point or this is really a critical point in the discussion. And the idea is really to have rather simple methods uh, to make the quality control. And this must be accepted. If they are accepted in the European Union, or it's better if they are accepted worldwide, this is the important point, to establish such methods as a really easy method which can be done in a few minutes, which are not expensive. And this is the idea, idea of the quality, but they must be validated. This is the idea of such quality control method because the, the, the users also, or the applicants, the co companies which import graphene, they want fast methods which, with their, uh, which they can use for testing the materials for their quality control of the methods. This is, this is really a need. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Jörg. Anyone else? No, then okay, fantastic. Then we are back on 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 the on the calendar uh, the, as as on the agenda. So please, uh, Terence uh, Barken uh, from Graphene Col Council will talk about framework on characterization. So the floor is yours, Terence. You're muted, Terence. You're muted, Teran. So good morning. You can hear me okay? Yes, we do. Okay, we'll we'll move right on. So thank you very much for allowing me to speak to you today. Uh, Terrence Barkin from the Graphene Council. I'm going to talk about our work on the graphene classification and standards. This is all within the ISO system, uh, TC229. Um, I caught a bit of Charles's presentation and uh, and listened to York uh, give us an update, and we'll just augment that. For those of you who are not familiar with the Graphene Council, we are a global trade association that's been around now for 10 years, since 2013, and we connect more than 35,000 material scientists and professionals worldwide. The vast majority of those are in the commercial sector. Um, and in fact, uh, in end user companies, large industrial and uh, small companies that are using graphene, as well as um, academic uh, experts who are within our community. <clears throat> we all know the history of graphene, um, isolated in 2004, Nobel Prize in 2010, which kicked off uh, a tremendous um, initiative with uh, filing of uh, patents and uh, development of, of um, production methods. And where we find ourselves today, <clears throat> which I think is important, is that uh, we see graphene being used in commercial applications on a significant scale. Uh, production capacity, for example, from uh, 2022 to 2023 doubled from 11,000 metric tons Per annum to 23,000 metric tons per annum. In the, we are updating that and expect that to be expanded again quite a bit um, as we do our report in January. Graphene, of course, can be used in all these different applications that you see here. <clears throat> we all know that. And that's one of the reasons why it's such an exciting <clears throat> material for commercialization. We all know the graphene properties, which are quite extensive. 
Um, and the relevance to this conversation here in terms of testing and characterization is that we do need methods uh, to test for all of these different characteristics of the material um, in the different forms of graphene and related 2D materials that are commercially being used. So what have we done? Um, in the past several years, the Graphene Council, together with over 100 subject matter experts as volunteers, created a graphene classification framework. And this was done for three uh, primary reasons. One is that uh, to make sure that there's a consistent way that graphene materials are regulated and registered, whether it be in REACH in Europe or whether it be EPA in Tosca in the United States, that these should be done in a consistent manner. The second main reason was to bring transparency to the markets so that both producers and buyers um, have a common language to use when they're discussing the materials in commercial transactions. And thirdly, um, the graphene sector has suffered from bad actors who uh, create material that they claim to be graphene, which is clearly not within the ISO def definition of uh, 10 uh, sp2 bonded carbon layers or fewer or the graphene oxides or reduced graphene oxides, everything that we consider within this family of graphene and related 2D materials. And so it's important that um, we can differentiate between what is and what is not considered graphene within that definition. The graphene classification framework is quite comprehensive. We have a list of 19 material characteristics <clears throat> for the bulk or multi-layer graphene. There is a different set of characteristics specifically for monolayer or CVD type graphene for sheet graphene. Um, with each of the different characteristics that are listed, there's a testing method um, that is either based on an existing standard. And for that, we look to ISO or ASTM or IEC for existing characterization standards. And then obviously for a lot of these, there are no um, published standards yet. Those are, that's work in progress, but we use a consensus of best practices from, as I mentioned, over 100 subject matter experts. We also have identified a range of expected measurement values. Um, those are not absolute in most cases. There, there are a range of values. It depends on the type of material. We've also introduced a consistent syntax or way of describing material um, so that it's a, a generic way of having a shorthand to know what type of material uh, one is dealing with. And, and um, that goes into quite some detail. And then lastly, we have a template for technical data sheets so that companies will report the different characteristics and descriptors of their material in a consistent way. And that allows end users and customers for these materials to then um, easily compare and contrast uh, one material from another producer. And it also encourages producers to disclose more information about their material than they typically have been doing to date. We use this information just to, by way of example, how does this translate into the real world? The Graphene Council runs a graphene verification program where we can verify either graphene producers uh, we also verify companies that perform functionalization services. So we va validate that they actually uh, start with graphene and then functionalize it to make it a, a different form of material and graphene products where we can actually determine if indeed graphene is in the product as claimed. And in the past year, we've gone through six uh, companies that have gone through this process and the verification um, uses the graphene classification framework as a guidepost for us. Um, that's something that the Graphene Council um, owns the copyright to, but that we have licensed to ISO to convert it into an ISO standard. We licensed that for $0. Uh, we gave it to ISO basically um, to convert that into an international standard, which is going through and will be final balloted uh, next year. These are the companies that have gone through the process, which we're grateful for, and um, they're helping us to push uh, the graphene sector to a higher professional standard. So the graphene uh, classification framework, as I mentioned, is currently uh, going through the final stages of review within the international working groups. Many on this call who are involved in the ISO standards process will be familiar with that and will have seen uh, this working draft 
of the document. It's something I think um, will make quite a bit of difference uh, for the sector because it gives us a consistent way to take what is literally hundreds and hundreds of different variations and forms of graphene and related 2D materials and to systematically differentiate one from the other. One of the other projects that we're involved in, you know, going to the next steps, is a technical data sheet inventory project. Uh, we have collected and so far categorized more than 500 technical data sheets. Uh, this is coming to a close with about 600 uh, technical data sheets that will have been collected. They will have been categorized according to the graphene classification framework uh, with the different characteristics. And the result of this will be that we will have the only uh, comprehensive inventory of all of the commercially available graphene materials that are on the market today that we can then group and uh, allocate according to similar characteristics and applications that they are suited for. And the intent then is to go forward under ASTM Advanced um, Engineered Carbon Subcommittee to develop an ASTM material standard. Uh, what that will allow then is for engineers and specifiers and procurement specialists to designate a type of graphene for their particular product or project um, using this ASTM uh, numbering system. This same information will also be used with IUPAC, which um, without going into too much detail, I think everyone is aware that under the CAS system, the CAS uh, number system, uh, does not accommodate the different morphologies of graphene. So therefore, um, it, is, it is not really relevant, unfortunately, although it's widely referenced. And CAS has no intention of um, taking on um, a CAS registration system that recognizes morphology. They just look at chemical composition. And uh, at the same time, IUPAC, which typically just looked at the chemical nomenclature for a particular material, has understood that um, at this nanoscale, the materials behave differently and that there needs to be a system to um, account for that. And so uh, we will work with IUPAC um, using the information that we've collected um, as raw data as input into that process so that IUPAC can have a chemical nomenclature that also now takes into account the physical morphology of the graphene materials, which affects their behavior, even though it's a non-chemical um, related attribute, um, it needs to be recorded somewhere and, and IUPAC has identified that as an opportunity for them to do that. That will take um, decades for that to happen, but we'll start that process. So that is really my short update on this. Um, we feel this is a really important um, initiative, this classification work, so that we can bring a consistent way of identifying, describing, re uh, reporting, transacting in the real world and the commercial world, um, these different forms of uh, graphene and related 2D materials. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions anybody has. Uh Thank you very much, uh, Terence. That was very uh, informative indeed. Um, we have time for uh, questions. We have nine minutes to ask questions to Terence or to the previous speakers who didn't have time to for questions. So please, um, anyone would ri uh, raise a hand. Okay, uh, Terence, regarding the, the the quality control of of products uh, claiming that they they have uh, uh, graphene in the in their composition in their structures, um, what are the what are the guidelines or or where where we can find the the procedures to 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 have a look at this and and also to um, try to understand where do we need to move uh, in the future for the, the kind of uh, procedures the, the projects leading this uh, this webinar uh, are involved. So so where, where we can have a, a deeper look on this? That's a, that's a good question. I mean, th this is work that the Graphene Council does for our members. I'll, I'll just give you uh, two examples. 
Um, you will remember back in April, I believe it was uh, 2020, uh, that the Canadian government banned graphene face masks based on some a handful of complaints from citizens they had. Indeed. Um, we we obtained the graphene council obtained the the face masks that were in question we had uh, the material dissolved to liberate the carbon content in that uh, we then tested that using uh, typical techniques everyone here would be familiar with with raman spectroscopy or with uh, xps with the, the chemical composition the material was not graphene this was from a chinese manufacturer that mm -hmm. claimed to have a biographene uh, a biomass graphene production process. We gave all of those test results to Health Canada, which is the regulatory agency. They then reversed the ban uh, in part based on the information we provided. In a second example, we have a member company that produces hand protection, uh, basically gloves for industrial use, like in a metal working shop. Um, they face uh, a wide range of competitors that also claim to put graphene into their uh, into their textiles and their gloves. We uh, procured five different uh, samples from the market from five different uh, producers of these products. Um, this was dissolved in a in an acid in a hot paraffin bath to liberate the carbon. We did the same kind of extensive testing that we do to verify any kind of graphene. Um, and in that case, uh, the competitive products did not contain, it was clearly they did not contain graphene. They had uh, silica and they had uh, steel fibers and other things in there, but not graphene. And we then uh, wrote to each of the companies that produced them and gave them the results of the test on their own uh, materials. So, you know, these are, um, you know, if you look at it ad hoc, uh, ways of doing this, but the, the measurement techniques are the same techniques we would use. The challenge in verifying graphene in a product is liberating the graphene from the host material. If it's a thermal plastic or a thermoset or a textile, in this case, polymers in textiles, um, the challenge is liberating the, the, the graphene, but um, that's, what, that's what we work on with labs that have uh, the capability to do that. I hope I answered your question somewhat. It's not, there's not a standardized protocol at this stage. Okay. That, yeah, that, that's really important. And, and one thing that you're mentioning and, and, and to me is kind of a, a red flag all the time is that uh, once a government uh, take an action like banning something because someone is claiming that uh, there is risk due to the content of this or that, that... Uh, the the bad press for the for for this kind of product is already there and it's very difficult to 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 fight that against uh, and and put uh, again our our name in in the good place and and the probably the best example is uh, nuclear power and uh, and in this regard what what are the the actions uh, the graphene community can take in order to avoid this uh, this kind of um, bad press regarding our uh, the materials we are using that is clearly bad press due to some uh, mischieving information or something that is is really uh, unethical from other partners that are uh, putting uh, graphene under the spot well you know i'll speak on behalf of the graphene council and i want to just reiterate you know we we operate globally um, we have a big presence in Europe. We're incorporated in Manchester and um, we would like to work more closely with other European bodies on this work. Um, we are very quick to react. Um, in, as I mentioned, in the case of Health Canada, we had a, a statement out within one week. We engaged directly with the regulators at Health Canada um, on this and then we provided them with test results. If anybody has these kind of issues, um, I would like you to think of at least contacting us to discuss how we can coordinate this in the case of these, uh, what I would classify almost as counterfeit products making false claims. We actually do the testing and then we contact the companies that are involved, in which case they uh, are made aware that they're making false claims. In many cases, those companies um, have been supplied the material from somebody else and they trust that it's graphene. They're not even aware that it's not graphene in their product and they're not aware that they have a problem. In other cases, 
people know that they're making false claims and it's done for commercial reasons. Um, we as a global body uh, are in a position to help coordinate this. And as I say, we're, we're quite active, uh, North America, South America, Middle East, Europe, uh, Southeast Asia, Australia. Uh, the only operational areas that we are not uh, really proactively engaged in are on the uh, Chinese mainland, Russia, obviously, and other embargoed uh, countries. Um, but otherwise, we have quite a good reach for this. And we have within our community, the subject matter experts in Europe, in US and elsewhere um, to help address this problem. And our, one of our main goals is the commercial adoption of graphene. And part of that is educating end users, instilling trust, and identifying bad actors. Okay, uh, very educational terms. Thank you very much for 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 all this information. I think I, I have learned a lot, and I, I guess that uh, most of the attendees also uh, got lots of new information. So uh, no, if there are no more questions, in uh, and Nesta uh, Elizabeth had yes. her hand up. I don't know if she has a question. Who? Elizabeth had her hand up earlier. I don't know if she has a question. Oh, I, I didn't see that. Sorry. Elizabeth, do you have a question? I think we, we can move it to the roundtable discussion later on because I think it's more of a question to generally the different pre presentations. And I think okay. we, I, I'm okay. fine with going into lunch and having okay. well, later. Thank you, guys. I'm going to say goodbye because today is Thanksgiving holiday here in the U.S. And so um, I, I will say my farewell to you and thank you for the chance to speak to you thank you terence enjoy the the the, the holiday and uh, thank you to all the attendees uh, we have 77 people uh, in the room right now so we see you in 40 minutes sharp please thank you very much